the saying, there is no fool like an old fool. You've probably heard that one before. And why, why that expression? Why the expression, there's no fool like an old fool? Well, that's because a person of age, a person who have, of age has had a time to study, they've had a chance to read. But not only that, but they've also had the advantage of life experience, have they not? They've had a whole life to observe and to examine and to say, oh, this is a good decision, this is a bad decision. And we are mystified at times when we look at the life of somebody who is older and they all of a sudden begin to make massively bad decisions. You say, what in the world is going on here? Why? Why is it in their studies? Why is it in their life? All these things which they've had a chance to examine and now all of a sudden they've blown it? Oh no, that, what, what, what a disaster. And we look at this and we say, that how incredibly foolish. And so therefore the expression, there's no fool like an old fool, comes about. Well, in our study, we've been going through old men of the Old Testament, and quite frankly, there's too many good, bad examples, are there not? We see far too many people who are, are failing to serve the Lord. And, you know, it, it's, they serve their purpose, do they not? They show us because they're cautionary tales. They tell us of examples where people ha who have not succeeded. But, you know, it's kickball Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, and, the, and my kickball game got canceled, and it's rainy and it's dreary. I need a good example, don't you? Yeah, I think so. And so today what we will do is we will look, I believe, at a faithful example, a faithful example to a faithful God. Because we've seen too many bad examples. I mean, we had Job recently, and Job was a pretty good example. But previous to Job, who did we have? We had Solomon. Solomon, where he had everything in the world. Frank, I mean, that's really, didn't he? He had riches, he had wisdom, he had the... He had the the bestowal of God's mercy upon him. He was the beneficiary. He was the descendant of David. He had the covenantal promises given to him. You know, on and on and on it goes. He had lots of wives. But see, that turned out to be a problem as well, as we know. And Solomon, in his old age, became an old fool. With all of the advantages that Solomon had, he turned into an old fool because he decided to worship idols rather than the one true God. There's no fool like an old fool. We saw the example of King Uzziah, King Uzziah who was strong until he was stupid, right? We looked, we looked at that. Here was a guy who everything seemed to be going just perfectly fine until one of the days he decided, you know what? Being a king is not enough. I need to be the priest as well, so let me take that position. That which does not belong to me, I will take it. He was even confronted and told, don't do this, and then he gets angry and God strikes him with leprosy. And so we have King Uzziah, the leper king. Well, again, I don't want to look at a bad example today. I want to look at a positive example. I want a little bit of hope here. And so today we're going to turn to a familiar passage, a passage which everybody, I think everybody here probably knows, okay? Which sometimes, as a preacher, I have to tell you, sometimes that's the harder passages to preach because they say, what new thing are you going to bring? I don't know. I guess we'll find out, huh? So maybe I'll be surprised as well as you, okay? Today we look at a faithful man who is faithful to a faithful God. We don't need another good, bad example, at least not today. I'm sure we'll get some more in the future, but not today. We're not going to. Today, we are going to see one who holds close to God, one who is faithful, one who will encourage us. So let us start in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1. If you open up the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1, You might say, well, Pastor, you're breaking your theme. This doesn't really work out so well. Because when we come to Daniel chapter 1, what we have here is we have not an old man, but frankly, we have somebody who's barely a man. In Daniel chapter, but stay with me for a little bit here. If you go start with Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1, we get a little bit of chronology. I promise not to do too much math with you today, by the way. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, that's Babylon, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in his treasury of his God. And what we have then is we have the, the raid of Nebuchadnezzar, which is taking place uh, on Judah in Jerusalem. And we have a young man named Daniel. And Daniel is going to be taken as a prisoner of war. Uh, read on just a little bit further on. Verse 3. Then the king commanded 
Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them literature and language of the Chaldeans, that's Babylonian. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. So what we have then is we have these fellows who have a privileged background. These are guys who are part of the nobility. These are guys who are part of the aristocracy. These are well, well thought of young men. They are probably in the area of 15 years old. So we look at Daniel, and Daniel, he is separated from his family. He is a prisoner of war. We need to understand that in the Old Testament, all wars should be considered as holy wars. All wars are holy wars. When you attack somebody and you defeat them, you get to say, my God is more powerful than your God, for I've won. My God is supreme. Your God is clearly inferior. We see this is shown to us somewhat when we see the changing of names in verse 6. Among them are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. Verse 7, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel was Belteshazzar, Hananiah, he is called Shadrach, Mishael is called Meshach, Azariah, he is called Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go for the children you're trying to get to bed, right? And so you have the, the transformation of these Yahweh-centric names switched over to Babylonian God-centric names. That's what you have. And why is this? It's because all wars are holy wars. They all are. When I win, my God is strong. When I lose, it shows that my God is inferior. When my God wins, I can maybe take some of your people and maybe your God, and maybe I can add that to the power which I have within my polytheistic view of life. That's, that's how it's done. That's how people think in that, those days. And so what we have then is we have this young man named Daniel along with his contemporaries, and they are asked to eat the king's food, to which Daniel says, I can't do that because it is a defilement to me. To which if I was one of Daniel's friends, I'm saying, why in the world are you making a principled stand about food because you don't want to be defiled because of God. Daniel, don't you understand that our God lost? Don't you understand that Nebuchadnezzar has come with his armies, besieged us, has taken, taken us prisoners of war? Daniel, that makes very little sense for us to continue to be loyal to Yahweh. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet Daniel is faithful to God, and Daniel goes through this elaborate process in the first chapter, and Daniel is vindicated. Daniel, as a young man, is able to prove his loyalty to God, and God blesses Daniel and his three friends, and they pass the, the, the test, if you will, and they do not have to defile themselves with the king's food. Hmm. Keep in mind, Daniel is 15 years old. If you're here today and you're 15 years old, you are the age of Daniel, the prisoner of war. You are the age of Daniel, the young man who says to the servant of the most powerful man in the world, I'm not going to do what you say because my God, by the way, who you just defeated, still is faithful. The book of Daniel continues on. You see you know, Daniel interpreting dreams. In the third chapter, you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You have the story of the, the golden... Um, idol which is set up in the wilderness and they're told to worship it and they say they're not going to and Nebuchadnezzar says you worship it or I throw you into the fiery furnace. They say we're not going to because our God will save us if he wants to and even if he doesn't, pff, burn us away. And they're thrown into the fiery furnace and what do they do? They survive. Pretty astounding. In the fourth chapter we get, uh, once again, we get stories of Daniel interpreting dreams. Here's our problem though. Our problem is, is that we tend to think of Daniel as a 15-year-old boy. We think of him maybe as early 20s by the time we get to the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego golden statue type of story. 
And we tend to, to fossilize Daniel at that particular age. That's what we tend to do. You know, you, you, get the, uh, you go down to the children's department, you know, and they're all singing, Dare to be a Daniel, right? Okay, and there are squeaky little voices, right? And they're all singing that. And the reason that Dare to be a Daniel, for example, is a great children's song is because you've got tiny little teeny tots and you want them to aspire to be like Daniel. And he's cl closer to their age, for example, than Moses. And so you, you want a relatively young hero for them, and here's Daniel. He's, he's tailor-made for them. And Daniel is young in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4, pretty young. And then we catapult. We catapult. We catapult when we get to chapter 5 and 6. We catapult 50-plus years when we get to Daniel 5 and Daniel 6. Daniel, when we look at Daniel in chapter 5 and in chapter 6, he is not a 15-year-old. He's an old man. He is an old man. Now, let me give you some math. Not hard math. Daniel and his friends are taken captive by the Babylonian army in 605 B.C. Okay? The Babylonian empire collapses in 539 B.C. I'll do the math for you. That's 66 years. 66 years. This means when the Babylonian Empire falls to the Medo-Persian Empire, Daniel has lived in Babylon for 66 years. If Daniel was 15 years old, that's a bit of a guess, but it's probably a good guess. If he was 15 years old when he was taken hostage, became a prisoner of war, we add the 15 to the 66, which means Daniel... At the end of chapter 5, in the beginning of chapter 6, 81 years old minimum. And maybe, maybe a touch older. Because when we go to chapter 6, which is going to be our main text this morning, so we go to chapter 6, the Medo-Persians may have been in power for a little bit of time by this time, so Daniel, I'm guessing he's 85 years old. I think that's a, probably a pretty good guesstimate. Daniel is an old man with very little hair, what he's got left is gray. No, it's not gray anymore. It's white. So some of you are saying, well, hold on a second. In the Bible, pastor, 80 some odd years old is not old, okay? Because we know Methuselah lived 969 years old. So you're not too old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's before the flood. After the flood, everybody lives much less. Yeah, but Abraham lived 175. I get that. Job lived 140 years after he had problems. I get that. But by the time you get to Daniel, just like today, 80 plus is old. Some of you are like, oh. if you're 80 plus, congratulations. It's okay. Old is a stage of life just as young is. Okay? I'm 51 years old. That's still young. But I've only messed with <laughs> There you go. But, but here, you know, but we, it's okay. When we get to a certain age, it's okay. Listen, you, we, Daniel's old, isn't he? If he lived in our society today, we'd say he's well into retirement age. Fair enough? Okay. Mm. You would think, scoot over to Daniel 6, by the way. You would think that as we come to Daniel chapter 6, Daniel as an 80-plus-year-old man, 90 probably on the, on the outside limits. I think 90 is probably pushing a little bit. But as we come to Daniel chapter 6, and we look at, at, at Daniel, and a little history here, by the way. You have the Babylonians. Babylonians are in power. The glory days of Nebuchadnezzar are long past. You've got other kings who have come up. Now all of a sudden you've got someone of a buffoon who is ruling Babylon, and Babylon is taken basically overnight. Okay? And the Medo-Persians come in. We have Darius here, or Darius. I like Darius better. We have Darius. He comes down, and he is now going to be the new king, if you will, or the new ruler of Babylon. So here you have Darius. Pick it up in 6.1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, that's some sort of administrator, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps gave, give account so that the king might not suffer loss. Okay? 
So each of these, Daniel is over at least 40 of these individuals. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So what you have here is this administrative uh, uh, organizational structure chart. You've got king, and you have 120, and then you have three over the 120, and it's all figured out. But the king is saying, you know what, I'll just make Daniel the, the man right after me, and he can control everybody. What a deal. He'll, he'll take care of things. That's what Daniel's going to do. Notice as we go into verse 3, Daniel, the 80-plus-year-old man, then this Daniel became distinguished among all the other officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The word excellent here is mentioned five different times within the book of Daniel. And three of them are attributed to descriptors of Daniel. If you go to the chapter 5, look at 5 and verse 12. In 512, Daniel is basically put into retirement by the Babylonians. But now they realize that they're in big trouble. And we look at uh, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 12. Daniel is brought essentially off the shelf, brought into active service, because an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams is about. And so when you get these, these words written on the wall, people are saying, who's going to interpret those? Bring out the guy with the excellent spirit. Bring out Daniel. We see it in verse 12, we see it in verse 14, and then we see it as well in chapter 6 and in verse 3. So keep this in mind. This is Daniel, prisoner of war. He is taken off the shelf of retirement, brought in to interpret something that's being written upon the wall at the very last day, the very last hours of Babylon, and he is of such an excellent spirit that the Medo-Persians, when they take it over, they say, this guy here is astounding. So Daniel retains his position. Not only does he retain his position, is that when the new organizational chart is established, they say, this Daniel guy is the top of the top. This is a great guy. We need to keep this guy around. He has an excellent spirit. Daniel, once again, he was probably partially retired under the Babylonians. And Daniel must be thinking, you know what? I've been called back into service, and <laughs> I'm old enough now. I'm old enough now, I think I should be able to hang up my sandals. Right? I'm here to tell you today that you may be at a, hand, at a sandal hanging age. You might be. But God still uses people at a sandal hanging age. He does. You might be here and you say, well, you know what, I've, I've, done, my, I've done my tour of duty. I have served, I have worked, I have ministered, I've been faithful to the Lord. When I was a 15-year-old, I was faithful. When I was a 50-year-old, I was faithful. When I was an 80-year-old, I was faithful. God's not finished with you because you're still breathing. Sorry. Yeah, but, yeah, but. Forget the yabbits. Yeah, <laughs> Daniel's going to be made the head dude. This is not well liked by the rest of the king's flunkies. Daniel, Mr. Excellent Spirit, if you will, he's not liked by these people with a cloudy disposition. Daniel has been faithful throughout all of his career, and now what does he get for it? He is hated by other people, people, quite frankly, with a lesser spirit and lesser minds. Hmm. By the way, When you are younger, this is where you start forming the habits of faithfulness. Keep that in mind. A person doesn't get to the age of 80 plus years old and say, now I'm going to be the faithful one. That's not how it works. Faithfulness is something which you begin when you are relatively young. When the tasks sometimes are not astronomical, but they're small. We see Daniel, and Daniel is faithful in, a, frankly, a small matter, in my opinion. Not eating the king's food. And he's faithful in this small thing. And when he's faithful in a small thing, God allows him to prove his faithfulness in bigger things as time goes on. So much so that we see Daniel by the time in chapter 6 that Daniel is basically right underneath the king. When we get there. But God doesn't ask him to be faithful on a lark. 
It's because we have seen faithfulness throughout his life. The question when you are younger is this. Will you cave to the social pressure around you to fit in? Because Daniel was not, it wasn't just Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were other people who were captured as well. They caved, and Daniel and his crew did not. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel, the man with an excellent spirit, verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps, again, the, the lower level administrators, sought to find grounds for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could, not fi- but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Now, the Bible is not trying to make the argument that Daniel is a perfect individual. That's not it. What they're saying here, or what the Bible is saying here, is that he is faithful. And what he is doing, he does it well, he does it right. And these people have become very, very jealous of Daniel. Daniel, he's going to take a position. It's kind of like, you know, if you grow up in a family with a bunch of younger siblings, and the younger siblings don't like the, the older sibling, and they're always trying to tear him down, you know. It's not fair that he gets that. Here they are, and they're trying to tear him down. So what do they do? They say, okay, well, there's an easy way to knock a person down, and when you find something where they're less than great, we'll find a skeleton in their closet. We'll find a skeleton in their closet, we'll bring it out and say, ha, cave to us, or we will show everybody in the world the skeleton, right? There's a way to beat that, by the way. Don't have skeletons, number one. Number two is that when people try to blackmail you, saying, here, I'm going to pull out a skeleton and let them. Go ahead and take it out. It's the only way that we can defeat this. Go ahead and take it out. Take that skeleton out. You want to go ahead and show it to the world? Show it to the world. Because quite frankly, if you, if you cave into that type of blackmail, then they have something else against you. Oh, not only do you have the skeleton, but you try to cover it up. It is often said that Richard Nixon, if he could have survived Watergate if he would have fessed up to it pretty quickly. But instead, he kept on trying to cover it over, cover it over, cover it over, cover it over. And the cover-up became more significant than the actual petty larceny. They're trying to find Daniel. They're trying to find a skeleton, and there's no skeleton to be found. And so the conspirators say, you know what? We've got something. Here's an idea. We'll use his faithfulness the faithful, the trustworthy Daniel, will use that against him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against the Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So here's their plan, verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. Okay, they're, you know. All the high officials of the kingdom, the perfects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, the king, therefore king Darius signed the document and the injunction. And so they said, you know what? We want to show that you're this majestic guy, Mr. King, and nobody gets to pray to any god or any other human being except for you. You're the only one that can be addressed. You're it. You're the man, King. And I think that probably touched the king a little bit of his pride a little bit. He must have thought, oh, that's pretty good. You know, I'm kind of the new guy here, and perhaps that will establish some sort of loyalty, you know? At least they'll know who's in charge, so that's, that would be okay. Keep in mind that Darius, he's, he's not a follower of Yahweh, not really, you know? He's a polytheist like most, and so if people want to pray to him, oh, okay, they can pray to him. Sounds good. So this is their conspiracy to go ahead and to put the the worship of God and the worship of the king at a juxtaposition, at a crossroad where they're going to run right into each other. Boom. Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to choose man? Are you going to choose your skin? Are you going to choose God? Which one one are you going to do? This is, I think, one of my favorite parts of this passage, verse 10. 
because you ask the question, what is Daniel going to do? Obviously, by the way, Daniel was not consulted in this. And when Daniel knew, when he knew it, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. <laughs> Daniel knew. When the people come up to, go, to arrest Daniel, he, goes, I didn't, he didn't say, well, I didn't know. He knew. If he knew, here, here, here's some strategies for Daniel for conflict avoidance. Okay? Daniel, for conflict avoidance, you could claim that you did not know the law. Daniel, for conflict avoidance, you could close your windows so people can't see. Daniel, for conflict avoidance, you could take a 30-day holiday elsewhere. Daniel, for conflict avoidance, you could just not pray for 30 days. I mean, that's not forever, Daniel. It's just, 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 it's just 30 days. It's just a small compromise, Daniel. But Daniel's a man of an excellent spirit. Daniel's a man who's trustworthy. Daniel's a man who is faithful. And Daniel does not, does not, does not change his behavior one iota. Not at all. He goes up to his upper chamber where, it is, where he is always at. He has windows facing open towards Jerusalem, and he begins to pray, and he prays there three times a day. Daniel, can't you pray at night? Pray when it's dark. Conflict avoidance. No. Three times each day. So then the tattletales, they have been studying him. They've been watching him. I think they must have been aghast. Verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before God. And then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign the injunction? Like they don't know, right? What a bunch of creeps. Then they came and said to the king, Concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes the petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den? The king said, the thing stands fast, because the king doesn't know what's going on here. The thing stands fast according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Okay, so evidently, by the way, so when the king signs his name to the piece of paper, it's law, and even the king can't change it. Okay, it's done. It's as close to being written in stone as you can get. Verse 13. Then they answered and said, <laughs> and they said before the king, Daniel. Daniel, look how he's described. Who is one of the exiles from Judah pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Now look at this. Look at all the pejoratives here. Daniel, who is one of the exiles, one of those prisoners of war, okay? From Judah, one of those Jews. Yeah, one of them. One of those Jews. Okay, this is anti Semitic, I'm certain of it. This, this guy here, he is dissing you, O king. Okay, he pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunctions you have signed. Aren't you the king? Who does this Daniel think he is? He thinks he can go ahead and, and do something different than what you command. How dare he? He makes petitions, not just once, not just twice, three times a day. Who does this guy think he is? Oh, king. This is a bad dude. But see, a king doesn't become a king necessarily because they're stupid. Okay? He knows what they're doing. Verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. What does that tell you about Daniel? I mean, if Daniel's a nobody... If Daniel's a punk, if Daniel is a, if Daniel's disposable, right? And kings have lots of disposable people, do they not? Ah, oh, come on, it's the cannon fodder, who cares? But Daniel's much more than cannon fodder. Dan, Daniel is not disposable. Daniel's an old man, 
and he is highly significant. The king heard these words, he was much distressed, and he set his, mi set his mind to deliver Daniel. He's not just simply upset, he's trying to figure out how to get Daniel out of this. And he labored, he labored, ladies and gentlemen. This is a guy who's trying desperately to try to, to fix the situation because he realized he's been tricked into signing this document so that Daniel's adversaries could get him thrown into a lion's den. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Evidently, and we're not 100% certain, but it seems to be a logical conclusion that the, the sentence has to be carried out by the time the sun goes down. And here he is trying to figure out how in the world he can save this very favored servant, and he can't figure it out. There's nothing he can do. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now know, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that, this king, uh, that the king establishes can be changed. And then the king uh, commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. You will notice that there is no verse where Daniel pleads or tries to make an excuse. Zero verses. He knew the consequences, and he did it anyway. This is how Daniel can be said that he is a man of an excellent spirit. Because a man of an excellent spirit does that which was right, even when he knows the consequences, he does it anyway. That's how Daniel can be faithful. That's how Daniel can be trustworthy, because he does that which is right, no matter the consequences. We oftentimes do a, a, a strange calculus and say, well, if I do this, then I'll get in trouble, and so therefore I won't do it. Or I better do this, otherwise I'm not going to be thought of as highly as in, by some circles. It's not important what other people are thinking about you. It is much more important what God is thinking about you. Well, king commanded Daniel to be thrown into the pit. He doesn't have a choice, right? The king declared to Daniel, look at this. Look at the effect of the faithful, excellent spirit of Daniel on this pagan king. May your God, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. I mean, those are words from a, from, from a, a guy who is a pagan, right? May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his signet ring, or with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. He's, he's keeping the law. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. You know, in a sense, he's trying to suffer himself that he might perhaps call upon his pagan gods to deliver Daniel. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. I think we have Darius, I think we have him, and he is in a spiritual crisis. What in the world am I going to do here? Verse 19, then at the break of the day, at the break of the day, he doesn't wait until after breakfast. He doesn't wait for after brunch at the break of day. As early as it is possible, as soon as the sun peaks itself up over the, over, the, over the rise, here he comes. Then at the break of the day, the king arose, and he went in haste. Kings don't run for much. Okay? And he went in haste to the den of the lions. Who is this Daniel guy? Who is this Daniel guy that makes kings run? Who is this Daniel guy who makes kings so distressed that they can't sleep at night? Who is this guy? And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried. He cried out in a tone of anguish. Look at the emotion here. And the king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. I think that's interesting, by the way. Where beforehand he is saying, May the God which you serve continually. Now he is saying, uh, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. He is calling God the God of the living. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? I, I think Darius is coming closer to a relationship with the Lord. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
And he says, my God sent his angel and has shut the, the, the lion's mouths and they, were not, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. And then the king was exceedingly glad. He's giddy with happiness. And commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. And so Daniel was taken out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him. Because, why? Because he had trusted in his God. I mean, I just love the story of Daniel because here we have faithful Daniel and a faithful God. Do we not? Daniel is not fantastic in and of himself. Daniel is a fantastic example because he serves a fantastic God. Daniel is theocentric. He understands that God must always be at the center of things. And we have seen this as a 15-year-old. We have seen this as a 50-year-old. We have seen this here as an 85-year-old. An old man who has every right to hang up his sandals and say, I'm at retirement age, I get to quit now. And God says, no, 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 no. I have better things for you than quitting. I have better things for you than death. I have a lion's den for you. That's what's better. (laughs) You're like, well, I don't know if I want that, except God can take a lion's den and use it for his glory. Oh, Lord, don't send me to the lion's den. But if Daniel doesn't go to the lion's den, we don't see the supernatural intervention of God. We don't see the faithfulness of God. Verse 24, And the king commanded, And those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the lion's den. They and their children and their wives. Notice this little extra note here. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones to pieces. That's pretty gruesome. Do they teach that in the little kids group? I don't know. I'll have to check with some of the teachers. I mean, just think about that, you know. Think about what you, that'd be quite the, quite the children's story. You get some old chicken bones and say, well, this is like the bones that they broke. See, that's why they don't allow me down in children's church. So, <laughs> a little warped up here sometimes, but, you know. <laughs> but think about it. I mean, that, so, listen, listen. You can, make, you can make this argument. I think that detail is important. I think, but you can make this argument. Well, Daniel was down in the lion's den, but it just so happens that the lions were pretty fat and happy because they had been given a very, very large meal just before Daniel was thrown into the pit. And so it wasn't really an angel. It wasn't an angel that stopped the lion's mouth. It was just that they had indigestion, right? And then the lions were so fat and happy and had a little tummy ache or whatever the case may be, so they didn't bother Daniel. Well, hold on a second. That type of argumentation is thrown out because here we have all of these people, a large group of people, and they're pushed into a pit, and before they hit the ground, the lions have, have their tearing them into pieces. Then King Darius, he wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. Because this guy's powerful. See, he's got all, he has all, he's, he's, he's an empire guy, right? And he says, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. You see, without the faithfulness of Daniel, starting as a 15-year-old and continuing to an 85-year-old, without the faithful of Dan- faithfulness of Daniel, you don't get this proclamation. But here he is faithful, and he makes this proclamation. People are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. Again, this is a guy from a pagan background, and here he is saying an incredible, credible statement about the God, the true God of heaven. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be, uh, shall be, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, we can ask the question is, Darius, does he become an actual believer in Yahweh God at this particular point? I don't know the answer to that. 
God knows. But what I do know is he signs a proclamation, and the proclamation that said all those who do not who pray to somebody besides me for 30 days get thrown into the lion's den. This guy also writes this proclamation, which cannot be erased. And the proclamation is this. Daniel's God is the living God who endures forever, and his kingdom shall, be, shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall not uh, end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has uh, saved Daniel from the power of the lion's den. He's writing that same proclamation. It has the same authority. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Perhaps that might even mean Darius, even the reign of Cyrus the Persian, but that's too complicated for today. Listen, when we get more advanced and aged, and we all get more advanced and aged each and every day, do we not? But the, as, as we age and as we get gain years, and as we gain years and we get gain years, we have more, we have fewer years ahead of us than we have behind us. This is how it is, right? We do. We don't know how many years we have ahead. We can count the ones behind. That's why we have sometimes it's like, oh, I don't. But keep this in mind. If you have put a lot of miles, a lot of years behind you, don't look back on those and say, well, but I've been faithful here. So I have the right to hang up my sandals. I have the right to retire. I have the right to spend the rest of my life on the golf course. Nothing wrong with golfing. Unless you're there 24-7. God doesn't want you to hang up your sandals. Don't just look back. Realize that God is calling you to be faithful. You say, well, I don't want to be faithful now. I've already put my time in now. I, I, I had the excuse of not going forward. Listen, why quit now? Why quit now? You're almost to the finish line. Are, 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 you going to, are you going to stop the race with 10 steps left? Are you going to stop the race with 10 steps left? You've got years behind you, and you've been faithful, but now you're going to take the last 10 steps off and not finish the race well? Finish the race well. Finish the race giving God the glory all the way. I'm here to tell you today it's a marvelous thing to get thrown into a lion's den. If it brings God glory. You don't hear about Daniel so much if he doesn't come out of the pit. Well, I guess you get the first couple of chapters. But that last one, that last one's a pinnacle. That last one's a peak. That last one is the testimony of an old man who is faithful from early young age, where he could have said, my God is taking me from my family, my God is taking me from my country, my God has lost the war, I have every right to be unfaithful now, but he doesn't do that. And as a 15-year-old, he is faithful, and he's faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. Keep on striving. Keep on working. Dare to be an old Daniel. Dare to be an old Daniel.